नम शिवाय ओम नम शिवाय ओम नम शिवाय ओम नम शिवाय नमस्ते सो हियर वी आर एट द बिगिनिंग of the introduction of Shiva Sahasranama. And Upamanyu, sage Upamanyu, is introducing the topic. And what does he say? The glorification of Shiva is actually beyond language, beyond words and letters. It can't be expressed in language. And why is that? Well, all language is simply a symbol for something. Like I can look at the clock and say that's a clock. Huh? But if I say clock, clock, clock all day, it won't tell me the time. Only the real clock can do that. Similarly, only the actual object symbolized by the word has all the qualities of that object. There's a tremendous tendency in ordinary consciousness to accept simple talk as real. In other words, that words have a reality, which, of course, they actually don't. They don't have any reality. It's simply arbitrary in most languages that we assign some meanings to some words. That's not true of Sanskrit, however. As we've been over in the Matrika series, Sanskrit, each and every syllable has a meaning. And when those meanings combine into words, the words express exactly what they're talking about. Because we're talking about states of consciousness. We're talking about states of mind. We're talking about meaning. So in the realm of meaning, words are real. See, just like in the realm of the air, if you've ever ridden in an airplane and gone through turbulence, huh? <clears throat> mostly the realm of air doesn't really touch us because we're on the ground. But when we're flying, any turbulence or eddy or uh, disturbance in the atmosphere can cause us discomfort. So in the same way, in the ordinary world, words are not real. But in the world of meaning, in the world of significance, in the world of thought, they have a definite meaning and a reality. And so Sanskrit is the only language, except maybe Tamil, ancient Tamil, now modern Tamil, uh, poetic Tamil, keeps the actual original meaning of the symbol because it refers to something abstract because it refers to a mental state, not a physical state. It's not a symbol of an object. It's not even a symbol of a thought, but of a whole state, a gestalt, a combination of many factors in one experience. Aum King to Devasya Mahata Sangshivtartha Padaksharam Shakti-tash-charitang-vakshye prasadatasya-chayvahi. Despite that, I would tell you in short, according to my limited capacity, using limited words and letters, the story of him who is the source of wisdom by his grace and blessing. And so Sage Upamanyu is saying, despite all these limitations of language here on planet Earth, I will tell you in short a summary of the glories of Shiva using these defective, imperfect, limited words and letters with my defective, imperfect, limited intelligence. <laughs> Because the glories of Shiva are unlimited. They're beyond any human being, or even a demigod. Who can count the number of stars in the sky? 
Huh? I mean, our own galaxy is estimated to have billions of stars, and there are uncountable billions of galaxies out there. The farther we look, the more we see. So how many stars are in the sky? <laughs> nobody can say. Similarly, nobody can say all the names of Shiva or all the qualities of Shiva or to speak of his activities because he's doing everything. He is everything in the sense of he lends beingness. He lends his existence to the apparent creation of the world. <laughs> apparent. His name is Bhava. We talked about that last time. Bhava means being and becoming. So being in the material world is always becoming because everything's always changing. And if the things themselves are in changing, their relationships are changing and so on. So he is actually the source of everything. Naturally, then he's also the source of wisdom. He's the source of true knowledge. He's the source of real cognition. He's the source of self-realization, enlightenment, and ultimate liberation. So because he is the one, you see, he is the only God who is actually the Supreme Brahman. Not even Vishnu, who has so many factors and qualities in common with Shiva by Shiva's blessing and who performs so many functions that are normally only Shiva's alone, such as giving liberation. Uh, Vishnu can give liberation because Shiva empowered him to do that. It's narrated in Shiva Purana. See, this is why you should read or hear or study better Shiva Purana, because Shiva Purana is like the origin story of everything. Huh? People like comics and, and other kind of stories that give the origins of something. Why? Because they create the context against which that character or that story or that narration has meaning. So everybody wants to know, you know, when they see Star Wars 4, 5, and 6, the first trilogy, they wanted to know what's the origin story? And I think it was very clever that they presented the latter part of the story, the struggle between the Empire and the rebels, first. So it builds tremendous curiosity. That where did this come from? How did this get started? So in the same way, when we see the world, to quote Ramana Maharshi, because we see the world, the opening verse of Uladu Narpadu, because we see the world, we have to have some explanation of how it came to be. Where did it come from? Who created it? Obviously, the world, such a complex thing, is a product of great intelligence and power. So, who created it? And why? And where is that person? <laughs> Can I get an appointment? <laughs> So we have to inquire into these things as part of understanding who am I. See, people go around, who am I, who am I, who am I, thinking that's Maharishi's teaching. But actually, that's only part of his teaching. Not only who am I, what am I? How did I get here? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do? And... How can I change my existence for the better? How can I advance in life? How can I increase my intelligence and my consciousness, my, my realization of reality? These are all part of the question, who am I? And so we need to know where we come from, how we're created, why we're created, and what we should be doing about it. <laughs> And only Shiva is the answer to all these questions. We can't say Brahman, because Brahman has no activities. Brahman simply exists self-sufficiently, eternally, without support, without conditions, boundaries, 
qualities, activities, anything. Brahman is just Brahman, okay? <laughs> but Brahman is the foundation that allows for the existence of Shiva and Shakti. And they are the foundation that allows for the existence of the world. Shiva says to Shakti, create a universe. And she says, well, what kind of universe do you want? And he says, surprise me. <laughs> so she does. I mean, look at the universe. Oh, it's, it's so amazing and sometimes so weird. I mean, the stuff that happens in this world, it's just uh, beyond explanation, unless you understand that it's the play of Maya. It's the dance of Shakti. She's teasing and pleasing Shiva. That's her purpose in life. That's why she exists. So once we know this, oh, then everything becomes clearer. It's like, oh, I know now why the world is so strange and unpredictable. It's because Shiva likes surprises. And also, Shiva likes jokes. <laughs> and what is a joke? But a secret wrapped up in a surprise. Huh? When the comedian pops the punchline, everybody laughs. And a large part of that is surprise. It's like you expect it, but you don't expect it exactly. Or you, you think you know what is going to happen, but it comes out somehow different. That's part of a joke, the structure of a joke. Why jokes are funny. So I'm not going to tell any uh, dad jokes here, don't worry. But the point of whole thing here is that we get this wisdom, we get this understanding, this knowledge, this realization, only by his grace. Ramana Maharshi says, we think of God by the grace of God. See, this is part of blessing. This is part of the fifth function of the Supreme, Anugraha, blessing from, you know, give us, O Lord, this day our daily bread, all the way up to aham bravasmi. <laughs> it's all simply blessings. In my life, I was very much struck by this because the spiritual experiences and realizations that I had, every single time, went far beyond my knowledge at the time. I had to go back and hit the books and do sadhana and meditate to catch up with, well, what was the meaning of that that just happened? Wow, you know? And I've told these stories on this channel. You probably all heard one at least. So, real spiritual life is participation in this knowledge. It's not a spectator sport. Uh, although many people do uh, get in the stands, you know, and watch the players down on the field, and maybe they root for one or another, you know, they join or this religion or follow that guru or perform a certain teaching or whatever. But actually, spiritual life is meant for the players. It's meant for the participants, for those who actually go out and experience the adventure. And this is what Shiva Sahasranama is calling us to do, showing us different, different sides and angles and points of view on Shiva. And each one of them is glorious. Each one of them is beautiful. Each is wonderful. Each is amazing. So that we can enter into this conversation. We can enter into the actual relationship with Shiva because that is the essence of spiritual life and enlightenment. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>